Hello, and good evening to everyone who is here. My name is Victoria Williams. I'm an Assistant Director of Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you all for joining us today, and as well as those that are tuning in online for a discussion on Hong Kong and the future of one country, two systems. Before we begin, a few uh, quick housekeeping points to share. We are on the record and we are also live streaming. We welcome your social media engagement, but please take a moment to silence your phones. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. Today we'll be taking questions from within the room and online. If you'd like to submit your question online, you can open up your browser, type in ccga.live, and you can also vote for questions that you like and would like for for Cecile to help ask them and, and to share that with our panel. Uh, as always, we thank you and we thank the council members for their support. If you would like to learn more about council membership, I encourage you to sign up for our complimentary council open house on February 27th and the details are on our website and we'd love for you to join us. So now it is my pleasure to welcome this evening's speakers. To my far left is Jeffrey Wasserstrom. He is the Chancellor's Professor of History at the University of California, Irvine. He is the author of numerous books, including his latest vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, which will be available for purchase and signing after the program by our partners, the bookseller, just right over there. Jeffrey, he writes for leading academic journals and contributes to the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, Atlantic, and among many others. He also served as a member of the board for the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. I have a Victoria over here, Tin Borhui. She's an associate professor in political science at the University of Notre Dame. Her core research examines the centrality of war in the formation and transformation of China in the long span of its history. She's a native from Hong Kong, and Victoria frequently writes and comments on Hong Kong politics for the Washington Post's Monkey Hay. Age, China File, BBC, Guardian, among many others. And no stranger to the council is our moderator, Cecile Shea. Cecile serves as a non-resident senior fellow on global security and diplomacy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She's also the council's advisor for the Next Generation programs. Previously, Cecile served as a US diplomat for over two decades, spending much of her career working on Asian issues, and her postings have included Tokyo, Edinburgh, and among many other places. So with that, please join me in welcoming this evening's speakers. Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many of you here, and especially so many younger people. So allow me to take this opportunity to remind you that we have an outstanding Young Professionals program here at the Council, and I hope you'll check out some of our upcoming events, because there are some really interesting ones that are also great ways to meet new people. And also, for any of you who are in your 30s or so and might be interested in our um, Emerging Leaders program, we have one of our current Emerging Leaders here tonight. Uh, the application um, period has been slightly extended into early March, so take a look at that on our website. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of audience participation, if that's okay. In our yearly survey here at the Council, we ask a broad uh, number of Americans, representative number of Americans, if they consider various countries a, um, a critical threat to United States key interests over the next 10 years, an important but not a critical threat, or not really an important threat at all. So my question for you tonight is, when you think about China, is China a critical threat to our vital interests over the next 10 years, an important threat, or not really an important threat at all? How many of you say critical threat? Interesting. About half. OK. So this year's survey showed about 38%. So. Um, and you'll see it dropped, right? The number dropped from a year ago or so when it was 42%. And I assume that was because when the survey was out, things were looking better on the tariff negotiations. Um, and it's a reminder that very often when we think of our relationship with China, we think of it in terms of economics or sometimes military affairs. But really, I think when people talk about the critical threat, there's a much broader set of issues. And indeed, if you were to speak these days to people who are experts on China and who follow it, you would find almost all of them, with the possible exception of Fareed Zakaria, would say that um, um, it is a critical threat, that China has become a critical threat. And this includes people who 10 years ago, including myself, thought, no, we just need to engage a little more. Everything will work out just fine. 
And one of our guests, Victoria, in a speech in the fall said, you know, if all of those people who just discovered that China is a problem had been paying attention to Hong Kong, they would have figured this out long ago. And so one of the reasons I think tonight's book is so important and, and very readable, it takes about two hours to read, I really recommend it, it's really very, very good, is that it's a way for all of us to see how China has treated one city and to perhaps learn something about the regime in Beijing by their treatment of this one city. So Jeff, could you start by telling us a little bit about got, how we got to where we are? What's been going on with Hong Kong since the late 90s, for instance? Sure, it's a, ple it's a pleasure to be here. In five minutes. <laughs> and you know, since, but it's not that hard to give a short answer when the whole book is only a couple hours to read. <laughs> There's an audio version too, 154 minutes, but you're very, maybe a faster reader. Uh, so I think the key thing to keep in mind um, when thinking about um, Hong Kong is in 1997, it became a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. Before then, it had been a British colony. The deal that was worked out at a period, worked out at a period of relative optimism, really, about where China was going. In 1984, a deal was worked out when Deng Xiaoping was a new leader, when China had just, announced, had just begun on this reform and opening move. It seemed to be the trajectory of China was toward becoming a more open society, at least very gradually. Um, the deal was worked out that in 1997, Hong Kong would become part of the People's Republic of China, but for 50 years, it would enjoy, quote, a high degree of autonomy. And this was called a one country, two systems plan, that it would be part of the country of China, but it would be able to maintain its distinctive system. The issue was, what did that mean? What was the different system? One understanding of it was that it was because it had a different economic system. And now it's very clear that that Beijing, in the time of Xi Jinping, thinks that's all it should mean. It would like to have Hong Kong maintain some different economic roles, but otherwise be completely in step with other Chinese cities. The example that's held up now is the other former colony that became part of the PRC under a similar one country, under the same one country, two systems thing. That was Macau, a former Portuguese colony. And now if you go to Macau, there aren't large protests. But there is a different system economically that's very obvious. You can gamble there. There are casinos. There are different ways to spend, make, and distribute money, which are useful to the Chinese Communist Party in its current moment. Hong Kong has always been useful to the Chinese Communist Party having a different kind of stock exchange, different type of, types of guarantees for international businesses. International businesses feel, feel good doing business there that might hesitate about being on the mainland. The problem is, the problem from Beijing's point of view is there have been people in Hong Kong that consistently thought what, one, what two systems really should mean, and there was some language to encourage them to think that, was also a different kind of civil society. More freedom of speech, independent courts, and um, some kind of elections, more of an elections that hopefully would lead to democratic selection of leaders. Already at some levels that happens. There was never full democracy in Hong Kong under the British. The British, they ruled it as a colony. There was some limited kind of um, participation by the local population at, at a lower level, but the most powerful person was the person that London appointed. Um, but late, right up before 1997, since whatever was in place in 97 was supposed to pertain until 2047, this 50 year grace period, the last governor of Hong Kong tried to make Hong Kong a bit more democratic when it wasn't going to be Britain's problem anymore. Mm -hmm. And it would be, and then what they passed on. So there have been a series of protests. Um, I'll just mention a couple that were significant. And you can find out more in the book. <laughs> in 2003, uh, there was uh, the local official, the most powerful local official is the chief executive who's elected but only about 2,000 people in a city of about 7 million get to vote in that election. And then they can only vote for people who have kind of made it clear that they can work with Beijing and Beijing feels okay with them. The chief executive came up with something called, um, what? there was one thing, left, one of the things left vague in the arrangement was what the sedition law would be in Hong Kong, anti-sedition law. And that was something kind of tabled, but Hong Kong was supposed to come up with one. So this was called Article 23. And uh, this was a hated bill that many people in Hong Kong felt 
if it came through, the kind of degree of different kinds of freedom of speech that people enjoyed there and freedom to protest would disappear. Before 1997, some people thought all those special rights would disappear immediately after uh, the handover. They were wrong. You still had a, a press that could criticize leaders that you didn't have across the border. You still had a vibrant civil society. You still had independent courts. There were also people before 1997 that thought once Hong Kong was part of the PRC, its ways would permeate the mainland, and cities across the border would become more and more like Hong Kong. They were also wrong. Mm -hmm. A key theme in the book is that predictions are usually wrong. Mm -hmm. As a diversion from Hong Kong, I noted in the, the fear of China thing, a prediction that was really wrong that I made, I, I, I'm just as wrong. I try to avoid predictions, mm -hmm. but when I slip up. In 2001, it looked that there was a lot of feeling of China as a threat. It looked like the decade going forward would be the big decade of US-China tensions. There had been a spy plane uh, crisis where a spy plane had, had made a forced landing in Hainan and the crew had been um, trapped. And I, I'm, I didn't make a strong, strong prediction, but I said when, when um, Jiang Zemin, China's leader, meets George W. Bush, this is what the, they were going to meet at a summit, at the APEC summit in Shanghai, this rising tension and differing views of Chinese nationalism and China's rise would be forefront of their mind. I was wrong, though. 9-11 happened. Totally reset things. Any notion of the big issue going forward right then being US-China um, issues were just, just delayed. So 2003, and this is relevant, the national security law, anti-sedition law, that was introduced in Hong Kong was sort of like the Patriot Act. But unlike the Patriot Act, it triggered large-scale um, protests on the streets. People saw this as something that if this happens, Beijing will keep going forward with other things, and soon we'll lose all of our kinds of rights. Giant, peaceful protests, and they worked. That's important because it gave people the hope that actually large-scale, nonviolent protests sometimes will work. Flash forward, we'll jump 10 years forward, 2012. Beijing decided to make another move through its proxies in, um, in Hong Kong to introduce a new kind of patriotic education into the schools. Uh, changing the civics, uh, the civics education in Hong Kong, you learn about things like the Tiananmen protests and the June 4th massacre. On the mainland, you don't. The authorities wanted to move Hong Kong more in step, just with the civics things. And some very young protesters, uh, high school students, including a 14-year-old named Joshua Wong, and one of his classmates, Agnes Chow, they formed a group called Scholarism that, uh, along with other groups who joined them, fought to push back against this. And it succeeded. Largely nonviolent protests again made um, the government move back. They were listening to the people even if they weren't elected directly by the people. 2014, there was a move proactively to try to make it so that the chief executive would be really elected by the people larger protests than, than had ever been seen on the main, uh, in the People's Republic of China in a city, sustained protests, called the Umbrella Movement that called for freer elections, and it failed. 2019, protests started again, again, at this time against a move to try to minimize the difference between Hong Kong and the mainland, this time through an extradition bill, and this time by protesters who didn't want to fail again, and felt even more urgency to this because China seemed to be even stronger and under, under Xi Jinping more intent on control. So there were giant nonviolent protests in June, the biggest the city had ever seen, by percentage some of the biggest in the history of the world. You had by some estimates two million people in a city of about eight million marching, which is a staggering, and it didn't work. Protesters began using more militant tactics the police began using, at the same time that protesters got a little more militant, police started being very brutal. The police force that had a reputation for restraint was using lots of tear gas, and then soon after that, um, rubber bullets, beanbag shot. And when they did that, the movement became largely a protest for the right to protest itself and against police brutality. And then a cycle went on where the government refused to budge and the protesters refused to leave the streets and even when pro some protesters got more militant and started um, engaging in more vandalism, 
which a lot of people thought would alienate ordinary people from the movement. Ordinary people, many of them thought the real onus was on the police brutality. And until there was an investigation of the police, the, the movement would enjoy popular support. And there's never been an investigation of the police. There's never been an apology or even an expression of concern. So that's how we got here. So I want to get to you in one second. But could you just talk about the extraordinary rendition or kidnapping or whatever you want to call it of the individuals right before the most recent round of protests started? That, because that seemed to be really key in your book. That's crucial. Between the end of the umbrella movement and the extradition law, there were five booksellers who were spirited, who produced the kinds of books that can be published in Hong Kong, but not on the mainland. And that sometimes make their way over the mainland because people come over and buy them. They, they're often gossipy stories about the private lives and corrupt business dealings of um, Chinese leaders. They're the kinds of books that Donald Trump really wish couldn't be published about him, <laughs> but can. And he's tried some ways to stop, and it can't work. The Chinese Communist Party would wish they weren't published in Hong Kong, but they can be. But there was an effort to intimidate publishers uh, from doing that. And so five people associated with the books, uh, with this publishing house, were spirited over to the mainland, forced to make confessions that were filmed. One of them um, is still um, being held on clearly trumped up charges. And um, he's a Swedish citizen. Um, but the Chinese government says he's ethnically Chinese. So we should be able to treat him how we like, even though there are ongoing negotiations. The, Swedes, the Swedish government is trying to get him released. But this had a chilling effect on people um, in Hong Kong, because it was a sense that being safe to do things that you could do in Hong Kong, but not across the border, were no longer safe. And then when the extradition bill came along, actually, Agnes Chow made a wonderful video saying, playing on the idea, first they came, um, the, the famous poem of first they came for um, mm -hmm. one group, and I said nothing because I wasn't in that group. Then they came for another group. This was written about the Holocaust, but she did it. First they came for the, book, for the activists, and I didn't do anything because I was an activist. Then they came for the booksellers, and I didn't do anything because I wasn't a bookseller. And the idea is soon they could come for any of us. The extradition bill seemed to say, now they can come for any of us. And against that backdrop, people um, reacted much more strongly than anyone expected. Thank you. So, so where are we today? W what are the protesters asking for now? What is the status on the protests? Yeah, so as Jeff also said, that the, the, essentially the protesters have five demands. One is the with formal withdrawal of the bill, which finally happened after the long summer, which, because C Carrie Lam, the chief executive, she agreed to suspend the bill only on June 16th, uh, on June 15th. So after a million people marched in the street on June 9th, and then uh, on Wednesday, on June 12th, a lot of people surrounded the Legislative Council building so that the Legislative Council could not meet to pass the bill. And the legislature is structured in a way that the government would always have the majority to push through any bill that it so desires. And then also on that day, the police began to use excessive force. And then many people were injured, and then there were these confrontations. And by the end of the day, the government insisted that what happened today was a riot, and then we arrest a whole bunch of rioters. We're going to continue to push through the bill. And then uh, somehow that Carrie Lam, she met with a Beijing official across uh, Hanzhen, across the, the border in Shenzhen. And then the next day, she agreed to suspend the bill. But people by that time were not willing to just take that, because again, the government can push through any bills. So, so long as the bill is still on the table, on the books, it could happen anytime. So people still wanted to have the bill formally withdrawn. And two, because of the excessive use of force by the police already on Wednesday, June 12. So then on June 16th, about 2 million people out of a population of 7.4 million show up in the street. And then more pe people continue to protest, but the government will not budge. And this is a sign that the chief executive really has no autonomy to, you know, to even withdraw a bill that's so unpopular. And then throughout the summer, the protest escalated. And only on September 4th that she finally agreed to withdraw the bill. And on that day, I happened to be testifying at Congress at the USCC Commission. And I thought, it really, you know, 
very often people would say that whatever the U.S. does, China doesn't care. But whatever the U.S. does, China cares a lot. And I, I, I would really, I really believe that, if not because the U.S. was involved in holding all these um, re, uh, hearings, then China would continue. China would like to maintain Hong Kong's special economic status, have the cake and eat it too, and then at the same time stifle Hong Kong's freedom. So do we know how many people are still in jail? They have arrested over 7,000 people by now, and then uh, they have charged only about several, t basically about uh, 40 people or so. It's noteworthy that among those arrested, about 2,800 people are students, and some as young as 11 and 12, the youngest is 11. And it is massive abuse of police power in the sense that a lot of those who are arrested, actually, they don't have enough evidence to, to charge them, and there's not enough evidence to also convict them. So another thing really kind of paradoxical is that the very one country, two systems model, it does impose certain constraints that so the Beijing cannot roll out the, uh, the military tanks to shoot at people. They also cannot um, send out the public security, as public security officers to, in wearing their own uniform and to patrol in the street. But what have it, they have done is something even more insidious, is subverting Hong Kong's uh, used to be very, very respected police force into just acting like mainland's public security officer. So I want to also say that when I was a little girl, we respected all the police, anti-police uncles. We never had any hatred or anything. We literally liked these people. And I also, I call myself a serial protester in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So through all of those years that you go out and protest, you have make high five with these police. You will never fear for them. Today, you are really fearful of the right police. So I, I am also making an argument in an article that precisely because the police know that they cannot, there are many people, they cannot really charge or convict in the court because a lot of judges remain independent. So then the perversion, the perverted result is they beat people up. So they, essentially we have a lot of, so 7,000 arrested, most of the arrested uh, uh, has, have suffered from severe injuries. They have batons hit on the head, when they're pinned to the ground, they, they basically the police will smash, the, smash their faces against the ground, and then they all bloody face, and then they, they also, also then pepper spray them. So it's really brutal. This is also why Hong Kong's medical workers have come out to protest many times even under the ban of Hong Kong police attempts to murder Hong Kong citizens. So the whole idea is that how do we get rid of all these troublemakers? We can arrest them, but then the courts is going to release them. That's what happened, what a lot of people complain about, what happened after the umbrella movement. And therefore, they have, they have inflicted this kind of um, debilitating injuries on protesters and supporters alike. Hmm. So, Simple question I've been wondering, well, maybe one of you can. When the protest started this last round, the press got it completely wrong in America, right? They said it was about housing. They said it was all economic. How did people miss the story in this country of, of how angry people were going to be over this extradition treaty and, and of the, the kidnapping of the booksellers? So one thing is um, there, are, there are excellent reporters on the ground in Hong Kong. Including some who have been, who are who are long term Hong Kong, who are Hong Kongers, and also ones who aren't Hong Kongers but have been um, on the ground a lot. The question is sort of what registers, hmm. what registers. I mean, there, the, and there was good reporting on the booksellers, but it it became a, a quick story rather than something that it was understood had really changed kind of local local society and mindsets. There are economic grievances involved. Housing, it's very hard. As a young person, you, you know, your chances of finding, of having an economic future, uh, it's very challenging in Hong Kong. There also are, econ along with the um, actions that Victoria described, one of the ways you can punish a, um, a protester, very, very, a young protester, is say they can never go to the mainland again. And international businesses want to hire people in Hong Kong who can help them get into the mainland. So I wrote a piece early on, would Mark Zuckerberg hire Joshua Wong? Joshua Wong, the leader, the public, international face of the um, umbrella movement, is a very savvy user of social media. He loves uh, using Facebook. Facebook, the, Beijing hates him. Beijing blocks uh, Zuckerberg's uh, Facebook from going into China. Zuckerberg wouldn't want to touch him because he keeps dreaming of getting access to the China market. He would not, he would want his, his 
Hong Kong people to be people who go to the mainland. So there are economic grievances. There's also a way in which the economic story and the political story are entwined. The chief executives before Carrie Lam have been directly linked to the tycoon class in Hong Kong, most of whom have made sort of a rapprochement with Beijing by which both of them can, can benefit. So there is a kind of, it's a very unequal economic place, and there is rage against that group. So it's not that there aren't economic issues, but we, and, but we underestimate the sort of way these are blended together. And the Chinese Communist Party has claimed that it's an economic issue because that's how they want to see Hong Kong, and it's easier to solve it. And the, the Hong Kong government has said, oh, well, maybe people, that's the kind of grievance that they'll, they'll allow some legitimacy to, whereas they don't want to allow legitimacy to these others. So they blend together. But in terms of not predicting how big they would get, nobody was predicting how big they would get. Activists weren't predicting how, nobody was telling me, I, I made plans to do this book, I had a trip which I told various people about. I was going to go on June 3rd to take part in this vigil for the anniversary of the June 4th massacre, which can take place in Hong Kong that don't, doesn't take place on the mainland. And I was going to leave on June 7th. And nobody said, why are you leaving on June 7th? On June 9th, a million people are going to march. There was a plan for a march, but there had been some earlier marches that year, and they hadn't been anything like that. Social movements are incredibly hard to predict. And at what point anger will lead to people saying, we just aren't going to take this anymore, is hard to predict. And uh, each generation of youth is hard to predict and often underestimate it. In so, this country, before Parkland, before that happened, a lot of, if you'd ask people, will teenagers, American teenagers, lead a giant march in Washington, D.C. Against, against gun lobby that it really seems impossible to defeat? You'd say no. And yet, that, I would say, I've said no. And yet, that's what they did. So, Let's take a step back here. So this is all interesting. Hong Kong's a beautiful city. It's terrible to read about what is happening to the people there. Um, why should we really care in the United States? Why should Americans care that people in Hong Kong are so terrified that their fundamental rights and freedoms are at risk? So there, I would have answered this differently in um, you know three months ago or, or one month ago. Now, one thing I would say is uh, an event like the coronavirus, and before that, SARS, another um, disease that we were worried about spreading. With SARS in particular, there was a cover-up. One reason why the cover-up didn't last was there was a freer press in Hong Kong, which was very near the mainland and connected. And it could publish things that the mainland did not want to be published. In this case, too, with this kind of thing, having a still any kind of freedom of press in Hong Kong is important in getting information out from there. So we're living in a world where what happens in one part of the world affects every other part of the world. So that's part of it. And also, there are things going on across the People's Republic of China, the most important in terms of repression being in Xinjiang, where there are these massive indoctrination camps. So the Hong Kong story is also telling us what kind of direction the current Chinese Communist Party leaders are taking the country, which is in a more tightly controlled one. And it's, so it's, it's exposing things about that as well. Anything yes, I, I would also say that for a long time, a lot of people have bought into Beijing's narrative that what happens in Taiwan, what happens in Hong Kong are strictly China's domestic issues of no relevance to how it deals with the rest of the world. But I would say that, you know, recently that Washington has been talking about this China reckoning. Well, the thing is that a lot of those issues that Beijing has been, a lot of the aggressive policies that Beijing has been pursuing in the rest of the world, they have tested them in Hong Kong. Think of this sub-military uh, form of control. So while you know it's true that the Be Beijing has not really sent out the, the, the Navy and the military to control the islands, but then they have completely taken control over the islands just by using uh, basically some, some military uh, uh, boats, very often using them in the forefront. And then another thing is people talk about the, P the BRI as a death trap. They have actually done that in Hong Kong too. So the Zhuhai Macau Road and Hong Kong Bridge, and also the High Speed Railway. Hong Kong bears the basically the huge chunk of the cost, and then we nobody knows when they're going to break even. And then at the same time, 
they also essentially, it's so much smarter to send out the bullet trains to dominate the society than using actual bullets. And then people have also been talking about China's sharp power, influencing domestic uh, 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 elections, influencing domestic societies, silencing opposition, buying people to support Beijing's policy. All of those have, been, have long been taking place in Hong Kong, but just for so long that everyone's looking the other way. And this is why that you essentially, if people had listened more to Hong Kong people who have been protesting for so long, for, the, for two whole decades, then I, I think that we would have been more clear-eyed. So you think about some of the things people are suddenly concerned about in terms of China. A story in Axios last week about the government, Chinese government using money to influence state and local politics now. We've known that there's a misinformation, disinformation campaign at the national level against us. Um, the hacks of US government computers, personal information, involvement in corporate hacks that, um, including Marriott and all sorts of other organizations. Um, everything that is going on in the South China Sea, which is extremely disturbing to many of us, um, ongoing espionage, both commercial and, and, um, and political. So what, are, what should the U.S. be doing? I, I, I guess if, if we're going to learn any lessons from watching what has happened in Hong Kong, and I guess what, is, what happened in Tibet 60 years ago, and what happened after Tiananmen Square, what should the U.S. be doing? But before you answer that question, I'm going to ask all of you, think about it. I won't take a poll this time. Um, your two options are we should engage more or we should actively work to try to limit China's power around the world and influence. And we asked that question on our most recent survey. Uh-oh, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. And you can see most Americans uh, say undertake friendly cooperation and engagement with China while... Um, only 31% say actively work to limit the growth of China's power. And I have to say, I think, again, among the China watchers, that has now flipped. There's a lot more concern that we need to do more to try to limit power in various ways, including, and this is interesting, though, while the public says we should engage more, they also say that we should not engage at the expense of our allies like South Korea and Japan, that we need to maintain close relationships with those countries, even if it upsets the Chinese. So I guess people have kind of a mixed feeling. But what do you two... Think that we should be doing given what is going on in China? So the one of the things is that it's really um, uh, a wonderful thing that the, the Congress passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act last year in November um, because I would also, I mean, I've also argued that the, why Hong Kong has not become Tiananmen Take Two it's actually very close. Tenement, while it is true that Beijing has not and probably is very unlikely to roll out the tanks, but they have subverted Hong, the Hong Kong police to do the job. And then also sharp power and, and other forms of what Hong Kong people call white terror, essentially silencing the opposition, uh, dismissing them, with, even if they cannot jail people just because they say something about go Hong Kong on the Facebook. So civil servants, teachers, they will be asked, you know, is this your Facebook account? If this is your account, you're in trouble. And so this, these are all very, very uh, nerve-wracking. But at the same time that uh, many people have also mistakenly praised, uh, as, especially the U.S. president um, has praised Beijing for reacting very responsibly. I would say that Beijing has not really gone full out only because of the fear of U.S. pressure. So with the U.S. Hong Kong, in, um, Hong Kong Democracy and Human Rights Act, then there will be sanctions imposed on individuals and institutions who actually violate Hong Kong people's human rights. This is very useful. And another thing is that Hong Kong, uh, a lot of mainland uh, businesses dominate Hong Kong's economy. So while the U.S. will not cannot export any technology for due use to mainland China, they have been shipping them to Hong Kong. And many of these mainland businesses, they have also established their, their branches in Hong Kong. They import due use technology and turn around and ship them across the border. So a lot of these issues, then I think the U.S. paying more attention to Hong Kong is definitely going to be helpful to all of those young people who have risked their lives defending Hong Kong's freedoms. So that's going to hopefully help the folks in Hong Kong. Does that do anything for the Uyghurs or the Falun Gong or the political prisoners on the mainland? Or? So I, I, with, with um, the Uyghurs, I do want to say I, I thought Victoria's point was very interesting about this. You, we should be looking how things are being tried out that could be done other places. Mm -hmm. And Hong Kong is the place where subtle moves 
are tried out that can be used to others. Uh, Xinjiang is where very unsubtle moves are being tried out um, uh, with facial recognition and other kinds of surveillance in which American co some American companies have been complicit and American researchers have been um, complicit. But also, the, fear, the, the lesson the Chinese Communist Party learned, I think, from Tiananmen was avoid things that make for these very powerful, compelling images that people find it impossible to forget. So doing things that the stopping short of actually shooting large numbers of people or significant numbers of people in Hong Kong, it won't capture the international imagination the same way that dead bodies will. And in Xinjiang, there's been enormous effort made to keep there from being the kinds of unforgettable images, even though they're unforgettable stories. We're, we're an image-driven society, so they've, they've kept it there. I think, the first, I, th I think it's really hard to set up those kinds of poll questions, engagement mm -hmm. versus uh, work to the power. I, the way I would see it was, after Tiananmen, there was a process. Actually, the Chinese Communist Party said, we've got to start doing some things differently. And one of the things they needed to do things differently was give people more choices in their everyday life and let people travel more, let them watch more movies, let them read more books than had ever been true in, in the kind of old Soviet bloc or under Mao. But let's keep them from having choices at the ballot box. And let's try to change the formula whereby a rising middle class led to democratization in places like uh, South Korea and um, Taiwan, which was a long time mm -hmm. authoritarian state. And the, the divide among at least a lot of the people whose writings on China I took seriously wasn't between people who were, say, engagement and, and non-engagement. And, and non it was between people who thought that via engagement, it would magically transform China into a liberal democracy like ours, and those who I felt more akin with who said, it's going to be a glacial process of change. It's going to end up with something different from us, but it will be a softer form of authoritarianism. We should, we should be hopeful and try to support the moves that lead to a somewhat freer society. So it was kind of engagement without any rose-colored glasses. And now, now the debate is more that there's a widespread assumption that the kind of engagement that's going on wasn't working and there was too much optimism. And the divide now is between people or the worry is I think between people who say China represents a challenge and even a threat in some domains, but now the worry is avoiding a kind of yellow peril, exaggerated fear on the other side. So it's this kind of debates within that, and I think it's not an either or engage or not, and it's really complicated because like on my campus, uh, on university campuses, there's one set of issues that we talk about when we're thinking about humanists in China who are being squeezed right now. There's another kind of conversation when there are people at, at Irvine, there's a project to study air pollution that's a joint project between mm -hmm. Chinese scientists and American scientists. And the argument, which I don't have a good pushback to, as worried as I am with Xi Jinping's so is, mm -hmm. don't we have to be working together on things that could help with climate change? So somehow there needs to be a, a way to use subtler levers and trade is not the big, and not think of trade as the biggest issue, but think of some of these other things. But the key thing is to keep attention on the place, to not just lose interest in Hong Kong when there's the coronavirus story, but think about how they're connected, to not just pay attention to Xinjiang when there's a new release, there was just a new release of documents, but consider this something that should be sustained attention. I don't have, I don't, I can just tell you what I think is wrong. It's wrong to praise. Xi Jinping as a, as a leader who's efficient and things like that, uh, and to criticize China, which is actually what Trump has done. Mm -hmm. Criticizing China plays into the narrative that Xi Jinping has, that the world is trying to keep China down. Praising Xi Jinping plays into the narrative that Xi Jinping and his backers have is, we need a strong man who gets things done. So it's absolutely the wrong thing to praise um, a person who's taken the country in a more and more authoritarian direction. 
So let me also get to this is that, so we know that just last month in, the, in Taiwan's elections that they, the most prominent slogan was today's Hong Kong, tomorrow's Taiwan. There have been actually a lot of these today and tomorrow. So today's Hong Kong people are also talking about today's Xinjiang, today's Tibet, tomorrow's Hong Kong. Because things, as they, they get worse and worse, Hong Kong's really going to become just like Xinjiang and, and Tibet. And then there's another one. In 1989, Hong Kong people had the slogan, today's Tiananmen, tomorrow's Hong Kong. Because the idea was that as of May before the crackdown, the idea was that if today China, Chinese students can really promote change, then tomorrow Hong Kong is going to be fine. And then after the crackdown, the idea got flipped over. If today they can kill their own people, what would they do to us? So there are a lot of these parallels. Another very interesting thing is that how Hong Kong people see uh, Hong Kong's relations with other peripheral issues. Until very recently, Hong Kong, even during the umbrella movement, the leaders would not go lobby for international support. There was no effort to push to lobby for the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, uh, even though it had been tabled then. There was no effort to, to support Uyghurs, no effort to support Tibet, or no effort to work with Taiwanese. But these days, everyone understands that, you know, we are all in the same boat together. Basically, if China knocks down one, the, everything else is going to really come down sooner or later. Thank you. Yeah, I was in Taiwan, got back a month ago, and um, interestingly, the high school students and the college students are not talking about if they can do this to Hong Kong, they do it to us. They're saying if they can do this to the Uyghurs, they can do that to us. So, I mean, that's how scared and concerned people are there, and um, very, very real. Um, okay, we're going to open things up to questions, and I have a few that people have uh, sent in electronically also. This gentleman has his hand up. <coughs> If you could keep them, get them concise, if you could. Yeah, Thank you. I, I mean, I noticed you guys are both professors, and uh, it seems like one of the areas where Chinese influence is is most, perhaps, um, pervasive is, is in educational institutions, whether in the U.S. or elsewhere. And I mean, we, the Harvard chemi chemi chemistry uh, professor was just arrested for not disclosing Chinese um, funding. So, what, what's your perception, being in universities, of of the awareness among academics and also students and of sort of those efforts and, and um, yeah, how, how does that then in turn influence debate around the US? So I think um, there's, it's a very, it's a very messy debate because there isn't, a, it, things aren't flowing in just one kind of direction. It happens differently in different fields. It happens through different, there's, there's been a lot of raising awareness about the Confucius Institutes, which were an effort by the Chinese government to, um, to shape, it's, and sometimes they're quite subtle. It's to shape the way we talk about China and what Chineseness means and um, how we borrow. So one of the things I think that, that's key that isn't done enough is comparing across these fields and across institutions and thinking more holistically about this and having so that the business schools should listen more to people who study China, I think, and dialogue between scientists and humanists and political scientists, there's not enough of that. Um, there are some people who are trying to, to try to pull that together, and I hope that that's what can be done. I don't think, there's no simple answer to this, but there needs to be more of a sharing information across those things. And we actually have one person who, in the audience who you should read, because she's a rare scientist who writes on these issues, <laughs> Yang Yang Chung. You don't, I won't say where you're sitting, but remember the name Yang Yang Chung. Uh, because she's one of the rare people who's writing from a scientist's point of view about things that also affect, because that's another one where when it's connecting the dots between these different phenomena, that's the first step toward a saner way of dealing with these. In the same way that having journalists and people from diplomacy on panels together rather than doing their own um, conversations and conferences. And sorry, I haven't really plugged the book. That's why I wrote, I mean, I wrote the book, <laughs> and a short book in a series that's largely books by journalists. And if people want to call it journalistic, early in my career, I'd say, don't dare you do that. That's an insult. Because the worst thing you could say to an academic is you're too journalistic. The worst thing you can say to a journalist is you're too <laughs> academic. And yet, if you ask people on both sides of this alleged divide, who was one of the great writers of the mid 20th century when it came to authoritarianism, mm -hmm. they'd all say George Orwell, who was a journalist and wrote fiction that's the most important text, arguably, for the late 20th century and early 21st century discussions of this. 
Um, do we have another question out here? Okay. Yes, sir. I'll wait for a mic, please. So, two questions. Uh, one is uh, this coronavirus, how it was managed. Uh, what would be the thinking in Hong Kong and Taiwan um, if they were part of China? Mm -hmm. And two, if the tanks roll, you can't separate Hong Kong and Taiwan issue. Will sanctions be enough, or would it U.S. do any more? Sanctions over, over, the, over the Hong Kong? No, yeah, if tanks, okay. if tanks roll. Oh, tanks roll, okay. So that gets to a bigger question. Let me just say one word about mm -hmm. Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I arrived the 7th of um, Please, you've been there January. I, was just, I arrived yeah. the 7th of January, I was meeting with senior people, and they all kept talking about this new mystery virus in Wuhan, and it was the first I had heard of it. And um, they said, and we're, we're really concerned because we're asking Beijing for information. They refuse to give information to us. We have a million and a half people coming home for the New Year holiday. And we have offered them our own medical services, and they have turned them down. Now, the only other thing I want to say about Taiwan is despite all those people who came home for New Year's, I think as of today, they've only had 18 cases of coronavirus in Taiwan. So that's a sign of when you have an open government, um, a very clean country. I mean, I, I do think that's part of it. Taiwan is exceptionally clean. Um, good medical care, and the people trust the government. You can, make a, you can make pretty good progress on these things, perhaps more so than you can in a country like China. So, so the first thing is that I, I, um, so I think what Jeff said earlier, that the coronavirus is really hitting Hong Kong very hard. It actually, for I would say it gives Hong Kong, the Hong Kong struggle, actually new hope in the sense that even a lot of people who normally are very pro-regime, they finally understand what it means when Hong Kong loses its autonomy. Carrie Lam does not even have the autonomy to close Hong Kong's borders. She does not have the autonomy to even bring Hong Kong residents from Wuhan. They continue to be trapped. These people, 2,000 of them, they, they are running out of medicine. They cannot just be bring back, brought back to Hong Kong. And so, and then we have all of these neighboring countries treating, basically blocking Hong Kong along with the rest of China. And so another thing is that while maybe autonomy, freedoms, these are very abstract ideas. For a long time, Hong Kong people, many Hong Kong people willing to, you know, if we get all the contracts, we can get rich, it's fine. But now when life is at stake, people actually realize that. So there's actually new hope that even the, the support for Hong Kong's autonomy, the, the struggle is going to actually get even broadened. And then when it comes to Taiwan, is it enough just to have sanctions? No, Taiwan, uh, it would need a lot more. The problem is that China, since 1996, when, when um, uh, Clinton sent in this, uh, the, uh, a battle uh, uh, a group to, uh, to the Taiwan Strait, Beijing learned the lesson that you know, next time we're not going to allow this to happen. So they've been developing these carrier-killing carry, carry missiles. If, Thai, if China, if Beijing really invades Taiwan today, the US Navy cannot defend Taiwan. So on the one hand, it is very important for the US to really get its act together. At the same time, it's not just about the US itself. It's also about building up uh, all the allies around. And that was essentially what the previous administration was trying to do. And at the same time, Beijing has also been taking, seeing a lot of these gaps and then taking advantage of them. Well, you know, if the U.S. now is stepping back from all the international organizations, stepping away from all the allies, you know, South Korea and Japan, you guys deal with this yourself, then China steps in. Just the same thing with education, that Beijing sees that, you know, U.S. cutting back on education funding. We are going to give you money. We are going to send you all the Chinese students, and they are cash cows, so every university loves them. So the U.S. has to really understand that we have to fill in those gaps as well and get our eggs together and work with allies. How much of a, how important is it that China be a little unsure of what we would actually do if they took, you know, unav if, if they, I, 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 to your point, they probably wouldn't send tanks into Hong Kong, right? But if things got really bad, they could send missiles into Taiwan, let's say. How much is that, we're not really sure what they're gonna do important to keeping them to behaving? So, I, I don't know, I don't know. That's hard. <laughs> Excuse me. That's um, that's out of my my area. But but, I mean, it's something I think about. But I just don't know, don't know how to. But what I do think about, that's more, is that regimes um, have to tell stories about why they deserve to rule for a kind of legitimacy function, and the story 
the Communist Party of China has told different stories through its history to justify it. And some of those stories don't work anymore. The story that we're going to make people equal, you know, economically. They, they, they're not telling it. The idea that unlike the Nationalist Party, our cadres are pure and not corrupt. Nobody believes that anymore. The stories that still work is a recent one about under our watch, the economy and the kind of quality of life has gotten better steadily over time. And under our watch, China, which had been getting smaller and smaller territorially has, and had diminished role in the world, has gotten bigger territorially, at least big at once and then gradually under each ruler, and is getting more respect in the world. It does, China does care about being, being able to tell that story about being part of international organizations and things like that. So the idea of being central, it still does actually care about hosting the next, the, the next mm. Winter Olympics. That's one kind of lever. But the worry is that when, if the economic story and the quality of life story is not working as well by slowing growth or by worry about public health, then all that's left is that kind of nationalism card. I, I mean, I, I think what's the, what would drive the Chinese Communist Party to do something aggressive in a place like Taiwan would be a kind of desperation that no other stories it's telling are working. And that's always been people's fears, right? And different experts said, diff you know, they have to have GDP growth of 4% or of 6% or whatever, or suddenly there's a chance of, of them taking a desperate action to maintain the street. But we, we, have, a, we have a culpability in that one of the things, one of the story, there's another story that they tell that we've been making it much easier to tell, which is, even that to stay in power, what if you're discontented, what's the better model out there? You know, the admiration for other parts, uh, the other structures have really gone down. And we've, you know, if we yeah. didn't want to see China become more authoritarian, we the best thing we could do would be have a more admirable democratic system. Yeah, I've heard that from a few countries lately. <laughs> uh, Evo has a question. Sort of twofold question on, on the coronavirus. First, in terms of its immediate impact on the protests on the street and, and how that has changed things. You saw the, the healthcare workers protesting, so there was a little bit of protest, but when there's a virus out there that is transmissible, yeah. having two million people on the streets is probably not a great idea. So, what's the impact on, on that, number one? Number two, uh, the stories that are coming out of China itself with mm -hmm regard to 150 million people now in, under true quarantine, 760 million people affected in terms of their movement. What does that story tell people in Hong Kong and in terms of their determination to remain independent, wh whatever you want to call it, different from uh, resisting the mainland, put it in that way? In those two ways, how yeah. does coronavirus change or augment the, the protest? Yes, yeah, so while it is true that people are not really going out on the street, but then on the other hand, because the government has no, basically, basically no one trusts the government's doing anything now, and they are trying to uh, set up these quarantine centers very close to residential areas without any consultation. So my, my family lives in Saikong very far away, and even there was never tear gas until two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. When people were also were like, what, you want to actually create, you know, set up these quarantine centers? And several hundred people just basically protesting very quietly and the right police show up, beating people up. Again, creating, basically beating people to, to all the bloody faces. And that has got a lot more people even more and more angry that you know, this, you, you have no legitimacy and you cannot even handle this. And Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government used to be the most efficient in Asia and now it can't do anything. So I, I would definitely argue that this is helping with the protests. Also, another lesson from SARS was that right before SARS, the government wanted to introduce the Article 23 legislation, as what Jeff said. And for a while, people were like, yeah, sure, you know, if you uh, disclose state secret, of course you should be punished except people yeah. learn that what state secret means 
it also can mean national health. And then when it comes to the second question about the, the legitimacy in the story is, so why is it that you know a lot of Chinese feel so proud of China's new missiles and new weapons, but why people have no faith in China's own public health system? This is why they go to Hong Kong, they go to Singapore, they go to Japan, they go to South Korea and spreading the virus to everyone. So this is a very important question that, and also the death of these doctors who are supposed to be whistleblowers, you can see that actually many Chinese themselves are getting very, very frustrated and upset. So I, I totally agree with Victoria, and I've been trying to write about this, that the, the movement, I've, I've submitted a piece that, uh, to a magazine that's the, the, the virus temporarily puts a check on most activism, but in the long run has more people convict, who were on the fence feeling like the struggle is an anti, is, is really, it's, it's in, in effect a, a colonial situation. It's an anti-colonial struggle that may go on for a long time, involve a lot of people. I just, the, the, there's also though a darker side to this, which I mean it would be remiss to not bring up, which is there is mutual um, stereotyping and, de and denigration of Hong Kong, some Hong Kong people toward mainland people and some mainland people toward Hong Kong. This situation is exacerbating that. There are critiques because the idea of it's something bad that's coming from there into this. The hope is that there would be a sense, increasing a sense of kind of solidarity. We're all suffering from this um, system, but it's, it's more complicated than that. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the same way it's important to acknowledge that there have been actions of extreme violence, small number of them by protesters against people, lots of them against people by the police, a large number of actions against buildings and, um, and things like that. It's important to, to acknowledge these problematic sides of the movement, but also to one reason is that those get amplified and exaggerated in the media that circulates on the mainland. And so what you have is I think one of the things that comes out of this is even though this could be a moment to build solidarity between places, any kind of statements about closing the borders that come out of Hong Kong will be read through the media system on the mainland is, look, they think you're dirty and dangerous and trying to keep you out. So it's a, it, that's one of the really complicated, messy things of this. And it's an important thing. It's important, though, that within the movement, there are people who talk about that and try to criticize that and try to talk about ways to move forward from that. And um, it's also important to realize there is, not everybody falls in, into these traps on both sides. When, I give, uh, when I'm on a panel like this on a campus, there's usually somebody in the audience who says, I feel kind of left out of this mainland versus Hong Kong discussion because I speak Cantonese, which is the language of Hong Kong, but I live in Canton or in Shenzhen, and I have family on both sides of the border. And so it's, it's complex. And I think the main takeaway we need to, with all of these kinds of discussions, is remember there are individuals who, even when they're trapped within an authoritarian system, have different points of view, and we should try to listen harder to voices that are coming out of China. And there are, they're, they're stifled often, but there, is, there are very brave journalists within China who are trying to get some of the story out with Tsai Xin and, and things like that. We should think about the, the, that there are real humans involved. You shared a really good article a few days ago that I haven't completely finished yet, but I, can you remind people? Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I share a lot of articles. I'll tweet, I'll tweet it out uh, yeah, later. Yeah, it was good. a translation. I'll tweet it out oh, later. Oh, yeah, the translation. Oh, yes. That was very, very good. Important. That was very yeah. good. Um, and speaking of Cantonese versus Mandarin, you have a very interesting section in here on how Hong Kong people also feel their language is to a certain degree under attack. And that was something that I hadn't thought too much about recently, um, which is an excellent segue to reminding you that the book is for sale over here on this table. It's available as an ebook also and as an audio book. Yes. Um, but it's, it's nice. It fits in your handbag or your pocket. So you pick up a signed copy while you're here if you would like. Um, We've got one minute. Can we can we do two minutes? Can can we uh, talk about Cantonese and we we just yeah. You want to say something? Okay. There's, um, there's one. Well, okay, one we'll get person. this question and then yeah. you can fit in Cantonese and we're gonna yeah. go th three minutes. How's that? Well, I can ask it in Chinese Cantonese if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no. <laughs> uh, my question is now in China, going back to the coronavirus and uh, and Hong Kong not allowed to close its borders. 
many cities, over 65 cities in China, were in lockdown mode, meaning they are not letting people out, they are not letting people in. So if they are doing that to Shanghai and Beijing, or, or they allow Shanghai and Beijing to say we're in lockdown, why not in Hong Kong? Why are they refusing to, to, to let Hong Kong kind of close the borders uh, the same way that all the major cities in China are doing so? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. Of course, you know, there's no answer to that other than because apparently Carrie Lam feels that she does not have the permission to do so. And so uh, there's been a lot of also criticisms of Hong Kong people. Every time she, essentially the way that she frames the issue is that Hong Kong people, if we try to close the borders, then we're being discriminatory against mainlanders. So this is why it's important to get back to the question about the tensions between Hong Kong Cantonese speakers and mainlanders in Hong Kong, and also Cantonese and Mandarin. I'd like to say that it's a process because if we look at any polls in Hong Kong, very often, very often we see that the, the number of people, the percentage of Hong Kong people seeing themselves as Hong Kong people only, that graph has been going up and up. So it wasn't really this high before. And then I was in Hong Kong on the last day of the, under British rule, and on that day there were tons and tons of these polls, and I was I answered multiple ones. At the time, everyone was still most people would still see ourselves as Hong Kong Chinese. Why the change? It's really so identity is constructed. Identity is a reaction to Beijing's encroachment into Hong Kong's autonomy. And also remember that in 1989, Hong Kong people shared so much solidarity with mainland Chinese that Hong Kong people donated tons and tons of money and tens and everything to support mainland students. And I would also say that over the many years, there have been a lot of mainlanders school moving into Hong Kong. And for those people, kind of like, you know, why people would come to the US, because we pledge allegiance to the Constitution. We like to, to, to the air of freedom. So for many generations, even my parents, they would go to Hong Kong running away from one party dictatorship, running away from Mao's China. But today, it's almost like you know, if you have Russians moving into, into to Chicago and then they, they, they keep um, um, protesting that they love Putin and they hate the US, <laughs> and how would you like that? You know, what are you guys doing? If you say that you, you know, why would you come to the US if you love your, your own one party dictatorship? So this is kind of the situation the Hong Kong people are facing. So another thing is that Hong Kong's population as of um, July 1st, 1997 was six million. Today, 7.4. And Hong Kong has had negative natural population growth, meaning that essentially the entire growth is all attributed to immigration. Hong Kong and China, has this, they, they have this arrangement that Beijing can send in 150 people every day uh, so 150 times 365 days a year times 20 some years. This is why you get over a million people. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong has no say over this. And also going back to you know if you are a if you work for even Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong, not just about Joshua Wong. You want to hire mainlanders who have very good connections with you know uh, party leaders in Beijing. So Hong Kong's young people just feel that they have no future, mm -hmm. and they walk, look around. They feel that they're being swarmed, and this is why this reaction. So so. So I, I, I think Jeff is absolutely right to look at also the troubling side, but at the same time, this is really a, it's kind of like the, the latest point of a long process, and we want to understand how we got to where we are. Thank you very much, and um, you'll both be around for a few more minutes. Thank you all for being here, and hope to see you again.